jest jednym z najfajniejszych atrakcji miasta Chicago. Nie tylko jednym z najprzyjemniejszych, ale też i jednym z najstarszych, bo ten budynek za nami, Shed Aquarium, był zbudowany już prawie 100 lat temu. W 1930 roku powstało akwarium tutaj w Chicago i jest jedno, no chyba tak z najbardziej niesamowitych akwariów na świecie. Dokładnie tak. My zabieramy Was na krótką wycieczkę właśnie. Czego najbardziej tutaj chciałabyś zobaczyć, dotknąć, może dowiedzieć się o czymś? Wiesz, no, ja wiem, że to jest takie typowe, ale no jednak te delfiny najbardziej mi się zawsze podobają. Są takie radosne, y, zabawne. Y, wiem, że tutaj raczej nie będę mogła się z nimi pobawić, ale na pewno o nich się wiele dowiem. No i jeszcze jest bieługa przecież, która nie tylko jedna zresztą, która jest niezwykle imponującym e, stworzeniem i e, myślę, że warto się tutaj wybrać, zwłaszcza jeżeli gdzieś się chce na przykład dzieciaki zaintrygować, zainteresować e, istotami e, morskimi bo jest to miejsce, które na mapie Chicago ma na pewno swoje olbrzymie znaczenie. Jak najbardziej. Przyjeżdżamy do Shed Aquarium nie tylko, żeby się zachwycić, ale też i wiele nauczyć o wielkim świecie oceanów i wód, o którym tak naprawdę chyba tak wiele jeszcze nie wiemy. Zapraszamy Was serdecznie. Niedługo dowiecie się więcej, jak jest tam w środku. A my uciekamy pod wodę. John G. Shedd Aquarium, an iconic element of Chicago's Grant Park Museum campus, a place where thousands of Chicago locals and tourists from around the world come to explore aquatic life and a historic landmark of the city for what will soon be a hundred years. Brian, what is the role of the aquarium here in Chicago? Why bring so much aquatic life to one of America's greatest cities? Yeah, so the question about the historical significance of Shedd Aquarium is one that I love talking about to our guests, especially when they come in just without the tour, because this aquarium was built 92 years ago. We just celebrated our 92nd year anniversary, May 30th, 1930. And what made Shedd Aquarium so special and still really special till this day is we were the first, the world's first aquarium ever to have saltwater animals near a fresh body of water. And that was something that John G. Shedd, who founded Shedd Aquarium, local Chicago native, really wanted to give back to the community that served him really well. And it's a connection. It's building those connections from where we are in Chicago to the aquatic world around us. Because as we know, right, the earth is covered with water, more than it is with land. And we know much more about outer space than we do about the aquatic world. And so here at Shedd, we want to bring the aquatic world to the communities. And what's special about Shedd Aquarium is our ability to not just reach guests here, but we can reach them there and everywhere in a seamless and joyful way. So coral is really important to these animals. It provides protection, it provides food, and it provides a job, right? Because some of these coral need these fish to help clean them. Just like the coral provides protection, they're able to help provide food as well. But we've got sharks. We've got Atlantic tarpon. We've got our volunteer divers who are in here right now cleaning the environment, but they also, we just missed a feeding session. So they're responsible for feeding all of the different animals in here. Now the big one that I want to point out is right here in the center. That is our green sea turtle. Her name is Nickel. And what's really special about her is she is what we call an ambassador animal because her story links the aquatic world to us humans. Now you might notice that Nickel is swimming a little bit differently than most sea turtles and that's because when she was really really young about the size of a dinner plate she was struck by the propeller of a motorboat. Now that propeller accident had hit her right on the back of her carapace or shell and it opened up a crack which trapped some air in the back of her and so you'll notice when she's under the water 
her backside floats up more than the rest of her body. That buoyancy problem out in the wild is going to be a big issue. So though Nicole may not be able to return to the wild, she has a happy home right here with us at Shedd Aquarium. Now this habitat is our largest habitat that we have at the aquarium. It is around 2 million gallons of water in this one area alone. Total, the Oceanarium is around one, 3 million gallons of water. So this is almost two-thirds of the entire Oceanarium space. But obviously, right, we've got those big animals like the belugas and the dolphins, as well as those sea lions that need that space in order to help do those natural behaviors that we see. Um, so with this, with this Oceanarium, we are able to provide incredible experiences to help the general public learn and discover about these animals. So it's not just about seeing those dolphins do those incredible behaviors, which of course is a part of it, but it's also learning about how they're able to live and how we here at Shed are able to take care of them to help them live much longer than they may out in their wild spaces. But that all happens right here in our nearly 800 seat amphitheater. So we can see up to 800, potentially a thousand people at a time which is pretty spectacular. And so the zebra sharks are one of our most enthusiastic eaters. They're um, so cute. And what's really cool about them is you'll notice that they're able to sort of like prop themselves up mm -hmm. and they don't have to swim. And that's because these sharks actually breathe through what's called buckle breathing, mm -hmm. where they have bucinators on their mouths to help them suck water over their gills without even having to move. So that's how they're able to sort of stand still while being fed. And you notice there's that buoy because our aquarists are up there having to target which zebra shark is actually going to be fed because as you can see that's a lot of mouths all at the same time. And our, what's really fascinating is us and folks at home probably can't tell the difference between these sharks. But the aquarists, they're able to tell the difference between each individual shark. Not just by certain markings that they might have on their bodies, but also by their personalities. Because these animals, just like us humans, right? We come in all shapes and sizes, different ways of thinking. So do these guys. So it's important to build that connection, just like we might build a connection with one of our family pets at home, whether it be a dog or a cat. Absolutely. And I think some of them look a little bit more friendly than, than the others. <laughs> like you mentioned the zebra sharks. Their faces look so cute and uh, yes. so here's the zebra sharks and kind, right while the other ones, I'm not sure what the <laughs> name is, uh, but it looks more like what we would uh, remember from the film Jaws. Yes. That one looks a little bit more aggressive. So in terms of their danger level, which yeah. ones are mean, which ones are nicer? <laughs> So I, I, I love this question because yeah, sharks can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And so those gray ones that look like those great white sharks are actually sandbar sharks. And the most dangerous shark out of all the sharks in here, and I use that word dangerous loosely, is actually not a shark that you're seeing swimming around at all. Oh really? It's a shark that actually lives on the bottom of the ocean floor and hides itself in and amongst the coral. And I don't see them out here right now because they're really good at hiding but they're called a wabigong shark. And wabigong sharks camouflage, so they blend in. And the reason why they're the most dangerous is because if our divers are coming in here, whether it be to feed the wabigongs or even to clean the habitat, they might step on them. Uh, and of course, as a human, we don't like being stepped on. Right. Neither does my cat when I step on its tail. And so, yeah, the wabigongs, if we step on them, of course they're gonna be a little bit agitated, right? right. I'm what? sure we've all heard that sharks can smell a drop of blood from a mile away, right? Uh -huh. Well, smelling works a little bit different underwater than it does in the air. So when we humans put smelling, that idea of smelling, into a shark, we think that sharks are like a bloodhound underwater, right? That's not how those chemicals will actually travel underwater. So ocean currents obviously can carry smells and chemicals long distances. But if we were to drop a drop of blood in this nearly half a million gallon habitat, do you think these sharks would instantly be able to smell it? Probably not. Probably not. Exactly. I know, I'm leading it. But that's because that one drop of blood has to diffuse itself amongst all the different micro, uh, microbiomes in the water. It has to go through all the other chemicals. So the salinity, the alkaline, the magnesium. And so sharks are actually going to use a couple of other senses more actively when they hear or when they sense something is in their home. So if it's not smell, then it's going to be sound is the first one. So if a human is putting itself in the home of a shark and it's making a lot, a lot of noise, well imagine if somebody was in your house making a lot of noise, you'd probably be curious too. And sharks, they don't have hands, right? So they have to explore the world through their mouths, much like a toddler might or a dog or a cat, right? 
So anything that has a mouth does have the potential to bite. However, sharks, they're not going to want to bite unless they're hungry. And as we just saw from this habitat, right, they're not eating the other fish. And that's because we feed them regularly so that way they're not hungry enough. But do you think that these fish out in the, out in the wild would have their own defense mechanisms anyway? Right, yeah. Absolutely. The coral is a big one, right? It can provide shelter for those smaller fish because a sandbar shark isn't going to be able to sneak in and around these coral. But another one is going to be about agility. Mm -hmm. So sharks are really fast, right? Straight line speed, but they don't turn very well. Mm -hmm. So these yellowtail fusiliers and even that red spotted or Achilles tang that's swimming right here in the center, they're really agile. So it's going to be difficult for a healthy shark out in the wild to chase down a healthy fish. And this is because this showcases how important sharks are for those ecosystems.